survive the food coma. I'm going to go ahead and put it back here. <laughs> Last Sunday in the, in the year. Did it go by quick or what? Yes. I blow. Went by so fast. Carol's going to start putting together a library in this room in here. And we've been collecting DVDs that you'll be able to check out, things like, uh, you know, Faith Like Potatoes and Slay the Giants and all those different, lots of different things. So you'll have some, if you don't already have, they'll be here. <laughs> you can check them out. Um, this uh, New Year's Eve, we're having Bunko here. You know what Bunko is? A bunch of crazy people rolling dice and trying to remember which number we're on. <laughs> and we're going to, we've invited Red Rock, so uh, should be quite a few people here. And and Susie asked if anybody knows where her dice are. Servants of the word. Therefore, 
since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. That's the man that he's actually writing to, but we get to read his mail, which is really nice. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That you may know the certainty. And every time I read the Gospels, my faith increases. The certainties I have increase. Because I see more uh, how uh, the, the word and, and the narrative and the history and the cultures and all these things work together in such a beautiful way that it just couldn't be an accident. Um, in Luke's narrative, we quickly move through the first 12 years of Jesus' life, his life as a child. And this might indicate to someone that these years are nothing spectacular, nothing special would have happened, just a kid growing up in the dusty streets of Nazareth. But not so fast. Jesus had to be born and grow up during a specific time, during a specific time, when all the prophetic and legal pieces could fall into place, and at some point, he would have to become aware of his filial connection to God the Father, his family connection to God the Father. What strikes me here is that there never, that there was never a time, neither before nor after this time, when the incarnation of Christ could have fulfilled the law and every prophecy. There was no time. This was the only time in history that this could happen. The only time. That really struck me. It's like God knows what he's doing. And he, like, he knows history. And he knows future. And he knows that this was the only time that he could send his son into a broken world to live with us and suffer the things we suffer but not be overcome by it. Because we believe in him, we too have victory. Wonderful things. Look at some of just a few of the things we've looked at so far. There had to be a first non-Jewish king on the throne. Herod was the first non-Jewish king. He was an Edomian. And Genesis 49.10, yeah, way back in Genesis, foretold that when there was no longer a Jewish king on the throne, Messiah would come. That's huge. The temple, the priesthood, and the people would have to be actively engaged in the Jewish religion. And that wasn't always the case. There were big lapses in Jewish history where they did worship God, where there was no temple, where there was no circumcision, where there was no animal sacrifice. There were big chunks of time when that wasn't happening. But this, right at this time, things were flowing pretty good. Elijah would have to come before that great day of the Lord, Malachi chapter 4 tells us. And Jesus told us, who was Elijah? John the Baptist. He said, if you can handle this, John the Baptist is Elijah. And so John the Baptist, we got this in our narrative, John the Baptist is born before Jesus is, is conceived. Or, John the Baptist is conceived before Jesus is conceived. So there's, a, there's order to everything. The miraculous conception would take place in undesirable Nazareth, but the birth had to be in Bethlehem. What would motivate a pregnant woman, and I'm not talking a little bit pregnant, I'm talking a lot pregnant here, you know, eight and a half months or so, nine, close to nine months pregnant, to go 80 some miles through a forbidden country, a desert country, jostled and put in danger of being robbed or killed or those kinds of things. What would motivate somebody to, to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Did God 
God know that the Romans were going to take a census? Yeah. But only at this point in time would there have been that motivation to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem so that the prophecies about Jesus being born in Bethlehem could come true. Mary, a young virgin girl of the proper lineage, would miraculously conceive by the Holy Spirit. This had to happen. Joseph and Mary would have to flee into Egypt to save the life of their child, an event initiated by a paranoid King Herod and a saving dream, a dream that the angel gave Joseph. It says, get out of Bethlehem, Herod's a coming, and he's going to kill all the babies under two years of age. So think of all of the accessory things that had to be in place for the primary things to happen. I mean, it's, it's innumerable the amount of things that had to come to, to, to pass or come into to being so that there's the perfect window for Christ to be born. The perfect time. The only time in history. You think God knows something about time? If God knows that much about that time, does he, do you think he might know something about your time? About when things are best for you? About when he might intercept you? When he might bring things to bear upon your life? you think he might know something about time? I think so. Every detail that we read is dripping with evidence that proved that Jesus is the Messiah and that our faith has concrete, eternal substance. You can trust the Lord. I'm going to pick it up in verse 21. Later I'm going to dedicate the teaching to John the Baptist, but I want to stick on Jesus right now. And in verse 21, chapter 2, it starts out, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. He was given the name above all names. Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. And nothing and no one else. There is no other name by which we must be saved. He was given the name above all names. He was given the most powerful name. Jesus, Yeshua. <coughs> God gave Abraham circumcision. The sign that those who were circumcised were God's people, God's chosen people, Israel. And there had been times of lapse where circumcision wasn't happening. But during this time, all Jewish boys were circumcised on the eighth day after birth. With Jesus, a name was given him before he'd actually been conceived. That's pretty amazing to me. A name was given to him before he was conceived. So Jesus fulfilled the law uh, in regards to circumcision, and it had to happen at a time when the Jewish people were actually doing circumcision. Okay? And then he's given a name that before he'd even been conceived. So the question came to my mind, do we exist as spirit beings before we're conceived? And the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. Now the Mormons say that we pre-existed with God, that God and his goddess wife produce offspring who inhabit human bodies at birth. And this is a purely Mormon Invention. It's not found in the Bible any place. God is married to a goddess. That's, wow, pretty interesting. The Bible teaches that a person comes into existence at the very moment of physical conception, not a moment before. We get that from Psalm 139 and Zechariah 12. Now, another question similar to that is, do we exist in the mind of God before we're conceived? And I would have to say yes. Several passages speak of God knowing people before they were born. Isaiah 49.1, Jeremiah 1.5. 1, 
But they do not refer to any kind of spiritual existence before a person's physical birth. He knows us, but we don't yet know Him. He sees all that's going to happen. He sees when you're going to be born, and this just this week, uh, Anna, uh, Kathleen and Doug's daughter had a young boy, and that's pretty neat, so Doug's a grandpa again. And he knows just when those times are supposed to happen. Instead, they indicate that God knows his plans that he has for a person even before that person exists. In comparison to how an architect, you can compare it to how an architect would know the building he has designed before the foundation was ever set in place. There is one exception to this, however. And it is Jesus. Because he was pre-existent. He is the pre-existent one. He existed before he was physically born. <clears throat> Only Jesus Christ spiritually existed before his physical incarnation. We get that from John chapter 1. <clears throat> Moving on to verse 22. We're really flying now. When the time of their purification... Now, how many, what do you have there? In your Bible, what does it say? When the time of... Her purification. Anybody else have anything else? Their. Their purification. Or their purification. Okay. Uh, I'll get into that just a minute. I just wanted to point that out. According to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be cons consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there is some question about whose purification is indicated here. In some manuscripts, it's her purification. In others, it's his purification. In others, it's both. The fact is that as a child, for Jesus to fulfill the law, his parents would have to fulfill the law. Okay? So there is probably a good pronoun, as good a pronoun as any, and speaks to us of our need, even as a child, of God's cleansing. So, it was 40 days after Jesus' birth that he was presented uh, to the Lord in Jerusalem, which was only about six miles from Bethlehem. It's important to understand the sequence, the background of these events. According to, the, uh, according to Jewish law, a woman became ceremonially unclean on the birth of a child. On the eighth day, the child was circumcised, after which the mother was unclean an additional 33 days. 66 if the child was female. At the conclusion of this period, the mother offered a sacrifice, either a lamb, or if she was poor, two doves, or two pigeons. In addition, the first son was to be presented to the Lord, and then, so to speak, bought it back with an offering. And remember Hannah, who brought her child after she conceived and had this miracle child, and she brought, she actually left it there with Eli, the priest. Remember that? Samuel. Pretty amazing. So she actually gave Samuel to the Lord in, in real way. But in the Jewish law, you were to redeem the first four years, to buy him back from the Lord. Well, I'm kind of uh, some of this timing of, on the when the wise men showed up and when the angels showed up and all these things. Some of that would be a little perplexing. Um, but I'm thinking that maybe the wise men had not yet arrived at this point. Uh, had they come with their gifts, they would have given Mary the ability to, to buy a lamb because they had gold, frankincense, and burnt, right? They would have been able to buy something that was a little bit more valuable. If they came, if the Magi came after the purification rites, their gift may have provided support for them while they were on the lamb in Egypt, you might say. So, but what they did offer was two birds. One of the birds would be a burnt offering, the other a sin offering. Well, what's that mean? What's a burnt offering? A burnt offering symbolizes the entire surrender to God of the individual or the congregation. The priest didn't get any of it, only God got it. It was all burned up for him. Have you ever done that? I mean, have you ever thought, you know, Lord, I'm going to present something to you where I don't benefit at all? I'm going to put this on 
I'm going to give this to you somehow, maybe to another person, or, or, or you may just sacrifice it to the Lord. Say, Lord, this is yours. I give it to you. And in that, you're just saying, I trust you for everything I need. I give this to you. I offer it as a burnt sacrifice to you. The second thing was a sin offering. And this wasn't for one who sins presumptuously. Those would be cut off from their people. It was a propitiation for the human inability, even when trying to be holy, to live up to God's standard, to always do right, to hit the mark. One would lay their hands on the sacrifice, transferring their sins to the animal, who would pay for the worshiper's sins with its life. Then the blood was sprinkled on the altar and sprinkled on the one offering the sacrifice, making it clean for the Lord. Redemption is a bloody affair. It's all a four, four picture, isn't it? Or a taste of, <coughs> of what Jesus, the Lamb of God, did for us. He bore our sins. He took the penalty that was due us upon himself. He took our sins, and in a sense, his blood is sprinkled on us, and his righteousness is imputed to us. We're made right before God because of what Jesus did. But it's not a thing that we have to do over and over and over again. This is a once-for-all sacrifice, which makes it especially wonderful. In verse 25, we see two witnesses. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I've seen the Messiah. I'm ready, I'm ready to die now. It's okay. I've seen him. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You see, salvation is portrayed as light. It would be a revelation, a light to the Gentiles, because they would be able to participate in God's blessing with a fullness that had not been revealed in the Old Testament. Jesus is the glory of Israel, because through him, the nation would see the fulfillment of God's promises. The nation's special role in God's plan would be vindicated. And then we see another one. Verse 33 tells us that the child's father and mother marveled at what was being said about him. This is not new stuff. This is stuff that, that's being said about their child. And they, they knew there was something special about him. They didn't know how far that went. <clears throat> they marveled at this. Verse 34, then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now this word sign is a metaphor taken from archers. It actually means a target. You're a target. And Jesus became the biggest target for criticism ever. Verse 36. Then there was the prophetess Anna, we got Simeon, and we got Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. Man, she stayed single, devoted to the Lord all those years after her husband died. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day. They probably gave her a, a place to live there at the temple. Fasting and praying, part of her daily or part of her 
merge into us, fasting and praying, seeking the Lord. Verse 38, coming up to them at that very moment. Again, it's about timing. At that very moment. I love this. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Look at these characteristics of Simeon and Anna. First of all, they were both looking for Christ. They were both looking for him. And because they were looking for him, they saw him where others missed him. They saw him as a child. The other thing is, they were both leading spirit-led lives. They were being told things by the Spirit. They were believing what the Spirit said. And they were being directed by the Spirit. Simeon is directed, go to the temple. Not now, not in five minutes, but now. Anna's in the temple and comes at this point now. And when they do, when they're in this obedience, they discover the Christ. Folks, we, live, we, we get to live that way too. We get to walk in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, who's directing us, revealing things to us, directing, directing us in our daily, daily lives. And when He prompts us, and I don't know how to describe that prompting, it's, it may be a little bit different for all of us, but I just get this sense of urgency. It overcomes me. It, it's, it stands head and shoulders above everything else that's going on in my life. It's like, Lee, God, you know, I hear it. It's like he's yeah, talking to me. He said, Lee, yeah, drop what you're doing and go do this or go there or, or whatever. Or pray. And I'm learning more and more to walk in the Spirit and to be obedient to that voice. Because I want to be like sitting man. I don't want to miss Christ in what he's doing in this world. I want to be a host for him. I want to be the one who he, he can count on and say, yeah, I know he is. I know he'll pick up on what I'm saying. And, he, and I get a sense, uh, when I go to meetings sometimes where there's interaction, you know, like sometimes we do, I never know for sure when I'm supposed to say something or not. Because I can say things all the time, but it may not be appropriate. I need to give space to other people. So I wait. I wait, and there's this normal level of stuff going on in my head and around me and everything else. Then all of a sudden, it'll peak. Boop. You know what I'm talking about? You're a sense that? There's this kind of boop, kind of peak. It's like, and I feel an energy uh, in, kind of surging into me, and my mind gets real clear. And my thoughts become very clear. And then I know I'm supposed to say something. And when I do, it has an effect. It has an effect. I know that because after some of these meetings, I'm walking out to the car. Some people come up to me and say, you know what you said? That was amazing. That really touched my heart. Well, I didn't know what to say until the Holy Spirit told me what to say. And then he directed me when to say it. If you, if you know what to say, but you don't know when to say it, you can mess things up. You need both, and the Holy Spirit gives you that. It's amazing. I don't want to be like that. They're my heroes. Verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything, everything, and they would have to do this so that Jesus could fulfill all these things, because obviously a little eight-year-old baby is not going to say, hey, priest, would you circumcise me, please? You know, he had to be taken in, and so their faithfulness helped Jesus to fulfill every single law. And they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get in the Bible, I like, to, I like everything to make, you know, to fall in order and make sense. And sometimes it doesn't. And this just happens to be one of the times that's confusing to me. And I don't know if you've ever tried to figure out the sequence of events in the incarnation of Christ. But one of the things is, when did the wise men show up? When did they go to Nazareth? When did they go to Jerusalem? When did they go to Bethlehem? And how is this, you know, what's the order of this thing? Well, the, the problem is, it's not easy to figure out. I mean, we've got the, the, the nativity scenes that show the, the shepherds right there where Jesus is being born. But I don't think that that really is the case. Anybody else interested in that kind of stuff? I mean, just, okay, well, just two of us are. Yeah, three, yay! I mean, some of those things are just, they, it's kind of radical. So I spent uh, way too much time searching you know, I'm trying to figure out, has anybody come up with an answer for this? And nobody does. I mean, they go, well, it could be this, 
could have been, could have been maybe this, maybe that, and everything else. You know, I'm thinking, okay, well, that's not helping me. I need some concrete answers. And sometimes Jesus just doesn't give you any concrete answers. You know what I'm saying? He just says, I'll tell you later. Okay, you know. Put that on your list of things to ask Jesus. So, when did you end up in Nazareth anyway, you know? When did the wise men show up? So sometimes you think, think, throw a curve at us. In this particular verse, they returned to Galilee, to their hometown of Nazareth, out of Jerusalem, returning to Nazareth. didn't make sense. See, now they had come from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And now they're headed for Nazareth. Wait a minute. When did the wise men show up? Okay, so, here's my best effort. And it's not conclusive. He was birthed in Bethlehem. Remember, we all agree that, yeah? And who was there? The shepherds, right? So we know in Bethlehem there was the shepherds. And then from Bethlehem, they went to Jerusalem for purification, right? Because it's only eight days old. They, they wouldn't even have time to go to Nazareth at that point. That was 80 miles away. 90 miles away. So from Bethlehem to Jerusalem for purification. And then from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, where they probably lived for a short time away from condemning eyes. I mean, after all, Mary, in the eyes of the people around her, got pregnant out of wedlock, you might say. And if it was Joseph's baby, then there were some issues there. So we're pretty sure that the wife didn't find him in Bethlehem, according to Matthew chapter 2. And we find out that Herod plans to kill the children because he finds out that the Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. And we know that Joseph has a dream and they flee to Egypt. Well, now we got Luke saying that they went to Nazareth and we got Matthew saying they fled to Egypt. Wait a minute. How does, it, how does this all make sense? And then after Herod's death, they finally end up in Nazareth. So what was their original, what's their final destination? Nazareth, okay? All along this thing, they are fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Going in, coming out of Egypt was a fulfillment of a prophetic word regarding Messiah. Everything that's going on is prophetically fulfilled. Now, my best guess is that in Luke's eyes, he's talking about their final destination. There may have been maybe some things that went on between where he says, uh, uh, and they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. There may have been years in that little section right there, but maybe Luke is thinking, ultimately they ended up in Nazareth. That's my best guess, guys. I mean, you can put that on your net. So my best guess. The main thing is they finally arrived at Nazareth and all along the way the prophecy would be fulfilled and Jesus is growing both physically, mentally, spiritually. He's an incredible guy. Well, he grows up. You know, we know he's a baby at that time, but he grows up to age 12, the age of accountability, if you will. Where he becomes the son of the, of the Torah, son of the covenant, of our mitzvah. So we have this Jesus at the temple. This next section, beginning verse 41. And this section provides the only account of Jesus' of boyhood we possess, apart from the apocryphal legends. The focal point is not his precocious wisdom, even though it's very noteworthy. Rather, Luke leads us to the real climax, Jesus' reference to God as my Father. This is the first instance of Jesus' connection, making those connections, that he is God's Son. His awareness that in a new, unique way, he is the Son of God. Verse 41, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. This was a 90-mile trip. This was a long trip. And we don't know whether Jesus went with them every time, or maybe this was the first time that Jesus went to Passover at age 12. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast. So we know that 12 years old, that he didn't go with them, according to the custom. And after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it, thinking he was in their company. Boy, I'll tell you what, you couldn't get away with that nowadays, could you? My goodness, you, know, you keep your kids happy in sight all the time. And they weren't too worried about him cruising around doing this stuff. 
thinking he was in their company. They traveled on for a day. So they left Jerusalem, and they're gone a day before they discovered, uh, where's Jesus? I don't know. Maybe he's with Aunt, whoever, Uncle, what, you know. And uh, so they're going, oh man, we need to find this boy, you know. Uh, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on it for a day, then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. So they thought, well, he just, you know, was something. They did not find him. Uh, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. So they went back into Jerusalem. And after three days of looking around in Jerusalem, they finally find him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And I'll bet Jesus wasn't asking um, normal questions. I bet he was asking provocative questions, the kind that he would ask somebody to un unveil their hearts and, and show them what their true motives were. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why are you searching for me? He asked. Did you know I had to be in my father's house? My father's house. Something connected for Jesus at this point. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men. I like this. Uh, even Jesus had to put obedience to parents ahead of ministry. It's interesting how, you know, those who feel that they're called to ministry think that they should, can uh, avoid some of the other things they're supposed to do because the ministry is the most important. I think Jesus realized that obedience to his parents was more important than his ministry. You think Jesus could learn something or didn't know everything? We're told that he learned obedience by the things he saw. He was learning, but I think he was a quick learner. <laughs> so I've got two focus points I'd like to conclude on. Um, first of all, with God's time. Jesus had to be conceived and born at just the right time so that we could be born again at this time. Think about that. He had to be born and conceived at just the right time so that we could be born again at the right time. When is the right time? Today. Because he was born at a specific time, we could be born again any time, but the Bible tells us today is the day. Today. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end of the confidence we had at first. Just as, as, as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in you see, God knows you, even if you don't know him yet. God foreknows you and wants you to discover your relationship with the Father. The same way Jesus discovered the relationship with the Father. He wants you to discover the relationship with the Father through the Son, through Jesus. There is a time for you. This is there is a time for Jesus. And I pray today, if you don't know me, today will be your day. This is your time. The second focus point is Simeon's prophecy about Jesus. Where he says, this child is destined to cause a rising and the falling of many in Israel and to be a target or sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too, he told Mary. When Jesus doesn't fulfill the Jewish presuppositions that Messiah would deliver them from Roman bondage, but rather than deliver them from sin, a moral deliverance rather than a political deliverance, it would cause a falling or the collapse of men. Another place Jesus is called a stone 
of stumbling and a rock of offense. He didn't meet their criteria. He didn't meet their expectations. At the same time, for those who began to understand the implications of an eternal kingdom through his teaching, would be their rising, the resurrection of many in Israel. Many expected a temporal prince, and in this they were disappointed. They loved darkness rather than light, and rejected it, and fell into destruction. Many that were proud were brought low by his preaching. They fell from the vain and giddy heights of their own self-righteousness, and were humbled before God, and then through him rose again to a better righteousness and to better hope. You see, Jesus is a target to be spoken against. You know, Jesus is such a catalyst for reaction. He'd come into a room and mess you up. You know, there'd be perfect peace. He'd come in and just throw, throw a monkey wrench in the works. Amazing God. Even from his early age, he's stirring up the emotional pot, you might say. Not only those parents, but also those who are listening to him. He's challenging or questioning their certitudes. This is the way it's always been. Oh, really? Why? <laughs> I love 12 year olds because I remember in the sixth grade, I was 12 years old, and I knew everything. <laughs> and the teacher was teaching about some, what the capital of some province in, province in Canada was. And I knew that what he was saying was untrue. And so I made a point of standing up in front of the whole classroom and saying, the teacher's wrong. The capital of this is so-and-so, and it says so right here in the book. Well, <clears throat> the teacher handed me an envelope to take home to my mom that day. And, uh, boy, I found the wrath of mom. I was right, but the way I handled it wasn't right. Sometimes being right isn't a good enough reason to say something. But Jesus was one who would just stir things up. He would turn over long-held traditions to see what, their, what was on their underbelly, you know. He was a lightning rod. He was just, boom! You know, truth has a way of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Why can't you just go along with the program, Jesus? Why don't you just, why, why do you stand out? Can't you just go along and get along? And the answer is no. This is why I came. Not to set one free from some external bondage, but to free them from the eternal bondage of a, slim, of a sin nature. He brings division before he, there can be a decision. He brings division before there can be a decision. He's got to stir the pot. He's got to make contrast. He's got to polarize things. Before there's a, a, oh, I actually have to make a choice between two things. Jesus said, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come here to smooth everything out, make everybody happy, you know, just make you know, no ripples in, in life. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Incredible. He's polarizing things. you got to love me more than you love anybody else.
I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. There's two possibilities. You're either falling, collapsing, stumbling over Christ, or you're being raised up in him. There's only two choices. You can be those who, who love God, love Christ more than anybody else, and if you do, then you so identify with him that whoever receives you receives me. It's a big deal. To receive Christ is a huge deal because it puts you in a brand new relationship with God. He comes in and fills you up so much so that He lives inside of you. And when people receive you because you're carrying the cross of Christ, because you're living for Him, and they receive you, they receive Christ. You can't be half-hearted as a Christian. It's all or nothing. You're all in, or you're not in at all. You can't walk the fence. Are you, or aren't you? And Jesus would say, listen, make up your mind. And when you do, I'm going to be there with you. There's only two possibilities, rise, fall, there's no neutral ground, joyfully accepting, accepting or totally rejecting. I'm going to read a couple of uh, comments from other commentaries. The division Jesus brings reveals the thoughts of many hearts. See, when he, when he says these kinds of things, it, it opens up a person's heart. And they're either going to be glad or they're going to be mad. Right? That's the action. That's the reaction. He's either going to be a target or not a target. He's going to be a target of joy or he's going to be a target of anger. Thousands have rejected the gospel and fallen into ruin. Thousands are still falling of those who are ashamed of Jesus. Thousands blasphemy, blasphemy him, deny him, speak all manner of evil against him, and would crucify him again if it were in their hands to do so. The thousands also by him are renewed, justified, and raised up to life and peace. This would bring a, a sword to Mary's soul. Simeon told Mary that a sword would pierce her soul, and Jesus' mother Mary would be grieved by the widespread rejection he would face. She would experience great pain when he died, although she could not have known it, and Simon had only a hint of it. Mary would be the only person on earth who would witness both his birth and his death. He was God's son, but she would always be his mom, and she would love him as dearly as any mom loves any son. The sorrow and horror he would face would affect her deeply. Not only Mary, but if you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, when, because he's a target, you become a target too. Jesus said, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. He says, take up your cross. Follow me. Make me the preeminent one that you love. And if you do that, then, and you align yourself with me, then you're going to be a light bearer in this world. If, you, if they accept you, they accept me. You become one with me. This is amazing stuff, guys. Jesus is always polarizing, always bringing us to the point of decision. They said, I really want to be your Savior. I really want to be your God. Die, folks. 
So don't give, you know, don't lose hope. He keeps tapping us on the shoulder and says, you know what, that really is my idol. That really isn't something that should be in your life. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son at just the right time. Romans 5, 8 tells us that why were you powerless just at the right time? You sent your son. You sent your son. We didn't even know we needed your son. We didn't even want your son. But your son's here. And he's real. And he's, our, and he's the, the only savior. He's the only God in human form. And he says, about, he asks of us today, who will you serve? Who will you give your life to? Who will you give your heart to? And that's a question we answer at some point in time, but we also answer continually after that point. We, gotta need, we need a starting point, though. And so this morning, I invite you to give your heart to Him. To say, Lord, and we say, Lord, flippantly, but Lord really means my King and my Master, the one I serve with all my heart. Lord, take my life. Live your life through me. I give you my life. Please forgive me my sins. Give me, please impute to me your righteousness so I can please God. Let your spirit live inside me so I can walk in holiness and do the things you want me to do just at the right time. Please, Lord, do all this for me. And then, Lord, as we go, as we make that initial step, uh, as we go down the path of life and you tap us on the shoulder, may we be those who are quick to surrender whatever he's pointing at. Because we know that whatever we give up is nothing compared to what we give back. And some of it is a temporal. Some of it is, but most of it's not. Most of it's eternal, most of it's spiritual, most of it's inside of us, not outside of us. And we discover a life that's abundant and full when we give up our life. Lord, I pray this morning that you would work in every one of our hearts. And that this might be the day, the time, the moment when somebody says, you know, Lord, I get it. You want all of me, and you want it now. And I surrender to you. I give you my heart right now. And there may be some of us that the Lord's been tapping on our shoulder and saying, listen, you're not surrendering to you things. I don't want you to do that because you're missing the blessings. I hang on to it. We want to do that this morning. We want to pay attention to you. 